Hi there, it's Vanda from Loki Loves. I'm re-recording this at home in my office as the intro didn't work, but I'm speaking with the wonderful Dr. Megan Hurst and also Mandy Thompson, which you haven't met yet. She's a team leader of nursery horticulture and she's been getting all of the plants ready for October's plant sale. So let's dive right in. It's so lovely that you can both be here. Thanks so much for taking a bit more time to chat to me. Now, I'd love to know how did you ladies meet and how did you end up working together? Well, my journey started about 15 years ago um, in the landscape team. And that's where I met Meg uh, when she was working on her brachyscone um, projects to, well, learn all about brachyscones in Australia and their plasticity and you know, how far the distribution stretches, among many other things. And we were able to grow some of those plants in the Australian garden. And that's when we recognised what brilliant plants they are. Uh, easy to grow um, and easy to enjoy all through the summer long. So um, a lot of these plants were grown in the science lab uh, for the Raising Rarity project. Uh, in lab conditions when they were doing their germination trials and then Meg was able to bring that that material here and we were then able to tube them up into more traditional potting mixes and grow them on um, to sell to the public. So we've also just been able to gather the seed together on <laughs> piggybacking on the science team mm. in their field collecting seed collecting trips. We've been able to come along, collect the seed and then grow them by more traditional methods um, outside of the lab. And we found that they germinated just as easily, just in mm. the in the glasshouse conditions. And, um, and that's what you want. That's what you want. Mm. You want an easy to grow plant, um, yeah. something that um, works well. And we can trial in the um, beautiful Australian garden. If you guys want to come here and see them all flowering in situ, as well as the Bogon High Plains. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's what it's we do. It's a bit of an elevation hike. Yeah. I mean, we, were, we were just talking about that before because, you know, these plants can grow in the alpine region, but then they grow in my coastal garden in Edithvale as well and everywhere in between. So very, very clever, very robust, durable plants and lend themselves to so many different garden styles. Yeah. I personally have a cottage style going on at home. So you can imagine um, the Brecus going to jelly eye, this Crospedia canans with beautiful yellow flower, and the Veronica nubia with a beautiful little soft purple flower. Um, all, all raising rarity. All, all rare, all beautiful, all easy to grow. Um, you can imagine them in your party air formal garden um, in the middle of Buxus. You can, you can just imagine them in different garden yeah. styles and here in a more natural garden environment in the Australian garden where we try to showcase the way they might look in nature as well. Happy to have this beautiful facility and a, and a fantastic team of horticulturalists that help run it. But really every, everyone in the landscape team as well is uh, excellent propagators and they come out into the field. So it's a real group effort with the science team piggybacking on their work. Um, and uh, the nursery, I've been here for about seven years uh, as the team leader. So um, when projects like this come my way, it's super exciting for the whole team because uh, it's something that's really meaningful to all of us, I think. It's sort of uh, one, th one level up on the high biodiversity values that we usually have. Growing plants that are uh, maybe not rare and threatened, um, but, but very beautiful for the Australian garden is already rewarding enough. <laughs> but when you know that these are really stressed in the wild for whatever reasons, uh, and that you can grow those and educate and share them with the world is really meaningful. So we're very lucky to have this facility and be able to focus in on that. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. It's lovely to be here today. So thank you for letting us come in and film here. So I'm sure we all have this really idyllic view of what seed collection and working in horticulture is all about so and glamour. the fun so and the glamour. glamour that you have. But I'm sure it's also filled with lots of challenges. Um, can you think of anything with Raising Rarity that's been a real challenge for you or something that you've tried but hasn't worked? Podolepis lasiata. Yeah. Um, absolutely gorgeous species. Um, we love it, mm. but it just kept getting absolutely hammered by um, snails. Um, it takes a minimum of two years to come to flower. Wow. 
Um, that's a big ask mm. uh, when you're trying to grow something for the home gardener. Um, I mean, there's gardeners and there's gardeners, but we really wanted to try and get something that would be flowering um, at sale and that they could see. Um, mm. That was one thing we noticed at the last plant sale. People are reluctant to buy something if it's not in flower. Yes, yeah. and the, all the species, mm. the suite of species that we've chosen, they do flower at slightly different times. So we've used um, just a few tricks up our sleeve, um, like pruning the flowers of the Craspedia canins down several times to get multi-flowering and just to stagger that flowering into the, into the sale event. Because as you say, Meg, like, people are going to fall in love with those flowers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, although we have shiny photos uh, up of when they do flower, um, you're just going to go to the flowers. It's, yeah. It's common sense, but they're, mm. they're absolutely beautiful foliage and form as well. Yeah. Um, um, I must admit, I quite like buying plants without the flowers because then I get that extra hit of joy oh, yes. you know you've got to get that other, extra yeah, dose yeah, in when it comes up yeah, yeah, yeah. of the other type of gardener yeah. where I'm like oh is it gonna flower for me and then when it does I feel like the most amazing person in the world because it's flowered just yeah. for me right. also the different growth habits sort of the different plants um, I've found in the nursery um, things that come up really quickly I would say those a little later and closer to the sale and then the grevilleas take um, a year to a year and a half to really fill a six inch pot um, and I haven't really grown plants for the public before that's really, really unique actually and shiny new pot production yeah. on yeah. plants that nobody knows really how to grow in production exactly exactly, exactly. Pretty cool. so they're not just for, for for planting in the australian garden which is our usual bread yeah. and butter customer service to the world now yeah we're fantastic <laughs> see i said you guys are super heroes and you are that's right. <laughs> heroes. yeah some of plant are heroes really definitely when you talk about some of the issues though um what we are looking at now though is taking a lot of cutting material from living collections mm. um, because for example with the grevilleas you, they just you'll never get the seed and the seed is vital that we actually keep that and bank that for um, reintroductions in the wild so while we can work with seed on some species because we can get abundant amount of seed and we can collect it mm. some species we can't so we have to look at um, other alternative well we look at alternative methods uh, for propagation and for cultivation and so ultimately for us um, that's the big challenge and that's kind of been a big challenge for mandy is then working out what's what works what doesn't work um, and that's really tough when you actually have the backstory on the species you're working with. Mm -hmm. but, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Um, but yeah, the grevilleas we're, we're really dealing with differently and um, seed there, we any seed we collect and we store for um, future purposes. Mm, that's right. So the cuttings that we take from the grevilleas are from plants that are already in the living collections we would never take from the wild to sell to the public. They're already established in our collections both here and at Melbourne and we're able to take that fresh material and, and grow it on with a, with a longer lead time. Yeah. And that's a great point you've made as well. If you are out there, it's fantastic you're out there enjoying nature yeah. Yeah. and you can always take whatever you want home on your phone. You yes. can take a photo of it and you can yeah. take it home and be important to be respectful of our 100%. natural areas. Absolutely. This has been propagated over many years and what we're working on is um, seed from seed orchards that we have established and that we um, collect from. With, with, with the seed orcharding, it's just in the research plots. When we put a species in and we bring it um, through a generation, in this case we're I think up to about generation five, where we um, keep growing them and then we collect and bank um, for raising rarity, we bank the seed. Mandy looks at it. I'll look at it under, um, you know, I will take x-rays and I'll, I'll look at its viability and test it and so forth. But um, this is one step removed. We're not um, taking plants from the wild, putting them in containers. No, and no, no. <laughs> giving them to the public. <laughs> well, actually, the last bunch of seed that these were grown from were taken from the last raising rarity plant sale plants <laughs> in this nursery that we're here last year. So there's a bit of a seed bank that I'm opportunistically um, yeah. taking care of when I deadhead them ready for the plant sale as well. So nothing's wasted. That's it. And you're getting that gener generational DNA as well with each 
each new one that's coming along. And that, um, the other thing that is important to um, really recognise is all the background work that goes on. For example, one of the species we're working with, Syrac Chrysler Palustra, uh, the Swamp Everlasting, uh, we're doing um, population genetics on that um, particular uh, species. We're going to see if there's differences between the populations. This is a species that has had a massive decline. Um, and so there's all this background work, and the same is applied. I'm sure Russell's spoken to you at length on the grevilleas um, and the, the um, representation, what he has um, collected and what is now representative of the different populations. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the raising rarity. We have the plant sale and it generates money, but that money goes back into the work that we do, which is working on the recovery plans of these species that are in the wild. So I guess that's really important to stress that um, this is the side where we get people engaged and really um, come on, this is really good for um, rare and threatened species in Victoria. But just to be aware that there's scientists, horticulturalists and um, practitioners working behind the scenes, yeah. um, as well as dealing with these... Impact and engagement yeah. team. Yeah. Oh, of course. And all the volunteers yeah. that yes. help all you out as well. It's, it's a really so big much. operation behind oh, the scenes, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. huge. So. Um, yeah, that, it's just all that research that goes behind um, to address recoveries um, and how we can re um, really um, do something about some of these species in the wild and how we can address... Um, yeah, and it's almost like a closed system then as well, isn't it? You get your sample while you're out in the wild, you're able to collect your samples, um, cultivate them, reproduce them, keep... Um, testing as you go along and researching what's going to work, what's not going to work, until the point where you're able to then put them back out. And See, locating or reintroducing, that's that's an extreme measure which, which has so much science behind it and understanding of that ecosystem. I see what we do as kind of an arc and a research sort of facility where we're banking and raising awareness and just sort of having an arc for these rare species. In some cases, we're able to translocate and reintroduce opportunistically, but I look forward to a time when we can look at the nuances there and, and really um, do, do some targeted healing of nature. Yeah. Take but them off the recovery plan. Yeah, yeah that, would that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Taking so many species off the, off the threatened and vulnerables yeah. list would be amazing. Yep. It is. It's a long haul. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. There's so much work and years and years of dedication that goes into it. And when you both speak, you can see the passion that's in you. You can see the love you have for what you do. And that's obviously the fire that keeps it burning so that you can work on projects like this and work on something for so long, not knowing what's going to happen. Best job in the world. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very meaningful. Yeah. This is different from the grevillea that we saw in part two, where we spoke to Russell. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I think Russ was talking about which is endemic to the Grampians, whereas this one is from around Omeo, so an alpine grevillea. Um, when I've seen them in the wild, they're, they're quite high and really robust and this silvery grey foliage. Um, very easy to grow from cuttings, slow growing, but um, just the most beautiful grevillea to have in your home garden. Uh, and seeing them in the wild, you can't actually believe how, how gorgeous these things are. Like, really. I've never met a gravillia I didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll be in the plant sale as well. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, these can get into more people's gardens in the future. Oh, thank you both so much. I really do appreciate it. It's been wonderful hearing about your work and your research and having you both join me today. And thank you again, Mandy, for letting us into your beautiful nursery. Pleasure.